This is what we call mobile range coupe. We did not come up with this. Um, this is from Polytex out of Minnesota. It was our sort of next step from the Joel Salatin pin. We got ourselves up to 55 Salatin pins. Um, and at that point, we had four or five hours of labor every day with two guys. And uh, the big one was honestly, the chickens do really similar in both systems. This works better in the heat of the summer. A lot more ventilation. Other than that, the birds don't really care between a Salatin pin and one of these. It's the same difference to them. Same stocking density, same everything. The big difference is human welfare. So when you're killing twice a week or even every week, you climb into those Salatin pens. You guys have all probably done it. You're reaching in there. Smallest guy's got to go. That's job sucks. Um, it still sucks with this, but it sucks a lot less. So you can walk in and stand up straight. You can feed real easily. This has a uh, water. It's on the other side, but it's got pressurized water to it at all times on Plasson float valves. So the water's done. Don't ever have to worry about them running out of water. The feed we're still doing by hand. I haven't figured out a way to set up an auger on that yet. It's like what I think about every day is how do you automate the feed? Um, and we're working on it pretty actively, but right now it's still more efficient for us to fill up five gallon buckets and dump them in. On this farm, we've got four coops. On the big farm, we've got 70 coops. So um, it's a lot of birds. We typically have run broilers in these for the last two years, and it works great. We run 500 birds, up to 600. If you really want to push it, 600 is okay. Um, but it's pushing it at 600. Daily move? Daily move, yeah. And what, I'm sorry, what was the manufacturer you said? It's Polytex, Polytex out of Minnesota. Um, how big is this? This is a 36 by 20, so 720 square foot on, call it 500 birds. I like a, a foot and a half. If you start getting up to the 1.2, be ready to have some problems, you know, and you need to manage it real tight. It's really paying attention to vents going up and down, really watching feed levels, water levels, cleaning the waters all the time. I really like 1.5 in a daily move. It's way easier. If you're not running really, really tight all the time, it's just better to, to run your numbers off of uh, one and a half square foot of bird. So for the layers, we just started doing this. So I don't even want to tell you our, I will tell you our number, but I'm not saying this is what works. We've got 350 birds in here. I look in and it looks good to me. It doesn't look overcrowded. It doesn't look undercrowded, right? And I really look more at the manure load behind the coop. I, don't, I wouldn't put another 100 birds in here, put it that way. I think we're probably pushing up against where I want to keep it. 350 will spin me out. It's good egg production. Obviously, I want the most birds I can get because it's the same amount of, of labor to move 100 birds as it is 350, you know? My big thing is I wanted to try to test this out for the layers so I don't have to day range them. I don't like the day range system. I know a lot of you guys are probably on it. For me, it's the electric netting. I don't like the kind of, especially when you start having employees. Oh, we moved them two days ago. It's fine. I don't need to move them today kind of thing. I like really crystal clear standards. Daily move, 365. These birds move. Uh, it has nothing to do with this, uh, the electric fencing moving around. It's got nothing to do with you kind of trying to look at the land and decide if it needs a move or not. No, it moves every day, no matter what. Um, it's a lot easier here. I can move these coops. I can move 700 birds in three minutes, you know, hook up. We got either uh, a pickup truck that'll pull them or at the big farm, we got a big tractor that'll pull them really easily with a nice tractor. Also, lower compaction if you have a tractor because the tires are a lot better. With pickup truck, you do have some compaction issues that I don't really like, but it's what we got here. Um, but yeah, I mean, hook up, especially the layers. You don't need the guy in the back scaring the birds to the front like you do with the broilers. They just pull straight forward. So far, this is about a month in max, and I really like this model. So. We'll see if we expand from it or not, but six grand. <clears throat> this is the Cobb Creek one. Okay. There's another one made by Featherman, I think. Yeah. And I think it's a 40 by 15. Or it's it's basically the same thing. Yeah, that's right. Stolzfus makes one too, right? A slatted floor layer one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's on a running gear though. Right. Yeah. Solar with the augers and all that stuff. That, that's 20 grand, yeah. But that's, that's auger feed, that's right. everything. I think it's roll out nest boxes, yeah. yeah. That's one of those ones you look at it and you reverse engineer it if you're smart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not paying them. Exactly. You couldn't do that with, uh, without netting, because they're, they're up. Exactly. So if you want it on the ground. Exactly. Is it a cover and all that, or this is added 
Six grand's all in. Really, I buy these at a volume. So I'm saying you would be at six grand. I buy them for like 4,500. And then it's really six grand after all my labor. And there's some things you gotta buy separate, like the wood on the sides you gotta buy separate. I think we do, uh, obviously all the feeders and waters and all that stuff you gotta buy on your own. Nest boxes, we run best nest box. Those obviously don't come with it. Um, I would factor in six grand plus labor if you're buying one or two at a time. Does that include yeah. This is dependent on a uh, flat land too. So one thing about Salatin Cube is a lot more flexible. If you got undulating terrain or weird stuff going on, this doesn't handle a lot of hills really well. It would handle some. And if it's a gradual pitch, that's no problem. It's more like the, uh, the big ups and downs. That's tough. Uh, one of our hacks is the rubber belting on here. Yeah, let's go around to the back. This thing's here. You would never move it to another field. Or nah, it's too hard. We've got other buddies that have tried it. Like, they'll literally hire a helicopter and move them around. So this is one of the coolest images for our tours. You guys have all seen it, so you know what it's all about. But, you know, you're standing on yesterday, two days ago, three, four, and so on. And you can literally see the regeneration, right? I mean, that's one of the most powerful things for the consumer when they come out here is to see and I make them walk. Like I'll take them on a walk basically for seven days and I go, that's, that's what it looks like after seven days. Imagine after 90 days of rest or 120 days. Uh, it's a really powerful thing for people to see that regenerative nature like happening in real time. Um, I like this. I've been doing chicken, mostly broilers for six years. And I look at this and it's, this is about how I like to see it. Honestly, the grass is a little longer. I'd like to see the grass shorter, but this manure load is about right. Uh, you can smell it, but it's not nasty or toxic. I, if it was half of this, I would, I would want more, you know, there is the right amount of manure for sure. There's too little and there's too much. So, um, when I sit here and look at this, I like it. A lot of it's going to get hung up on, I mean, you see how tall this grass is underneath. That's why it's really good to graze it first or mow it. Cause a lot of that manure, it's going to take a lot, a lot longer for it to get into the soil going through all that grass, but it's a good problem to have. Too much grass is a good problem to have. Exactly. Well, what's your solar panel charging? Yeah, good call. If we have a hand light inside, okay. and that'll give them 16 hours of light a day. Got it. How long have you had that? We just got them. And I know they're so fraught I, I with problems. Oh, okay. I'm, I've thought about it, but everyone's talking how there's no... People are talking trash on them on the Apple forums yeah. big time. <laughs> yeah. And they say the big thing is there's no customer service. Yeah. Henlight, I'm happy with it so far. I haven't needed customer service. Uh, it's been great for us. Yeah. So it'll kick on a light. Basically, you can program to kick it on whenever, but for commercial production, you really need your hens on 16 hours of light. You, you run supplemental lighting? We do, yeah, yeah, we just have it. Just normal lights with a right. timer. Yeah. Um, and but then I we really also like have the, the, the way it replicates sun up, sun down. This one has a special, uh, whatever the spectrum of light is. So it's not just a neon light coming on, it's the right spectrum of daylight to come on. And uh, I don't even know if it works yet because these guys aren't in full production. They're only about 22, 23 weeks old. So they're just coming online right now. We did, we bought started pullets at 18 weeks. And uh, I'm a big fan of that. Brooding's good if you can do it. I don't have the patience for the egg thing in the first place. So for me getting started pullets and it's hard to find ones that have their beaks and then not antibiotics. I mean, that's tough. Vaccines, we ours have vaccine. I kind of like it if they didn't, but they had to at the place that we were getting them from. But we paid like eight bucks each. And uh, I guarantee I can sell the finished stewing hen after their laying cycle for 15. Okay. So I don't even consider the eight bucks a cost, yeah. you know? Um, I mean, it's cash going out, but it's really not an expense. Uh, I'll get all the egg production from them and then I'll flip the actual bird for another seven bucks at the, I, we plan to not run a molt cycle. Uh, if you keep small flocks, typically you're going to want to run through at least one molt, maybe even two molts and, uh, just research that. I'm not the expert on molting, but you do want to control that and know when you're going into a molt and, uh, do you force molt or how are you doing it? Uh, no, we haven't ever actually. Yeah. So they'll hit a molt eventually Yeah, we just kinda let them do their thing. and you'll be feeding them and they won't be laying. And so my plan is to kill them before that. It's about 95 weeks when they'll hit their yeah, first molt. We're, we're getting rid of about 18 to 22 weeks. Okay, exactly. So pretty much right around that. Yeah, right around the first molt. Yeah. Commercially, it just makes the numbers 
a lot easier. I know that the industry will take them through a molt or even two molts sometimes, depending on egg prices and stuff, what's going on. But for me, um, I got a market for the stewing hens. I know I can sell them at 15 at a profit. I'd way rather just bring in fresh hens all the time. And so uh, we're starting with 700 right here in two coops, but we, uh, we'll see. We'll see where the market takes us. Not at the big farm all yet. Broilers, big farm. That's right. Gotcha. And we'll typically run broilers here too, at least for tours and demos and stuff like that. But yeah. with the Newcastle thing and all this rain, you'll see a lot of straw around here. Yep. And the reason that, that's not normal, but the reason we'll do that is if we can't get a truck into the field, you know, it's either we straw the coop or we move the coop. So if it's so wet, we can't even get in here. We're just tearing it. You can see there's spots where we've teared it up pretty good. Uh, we'll just bring in fresh straw for them for a day or two until the field's dry enough, then we'll move them after that. That's the backup plan. I don't like doing that, but it's better than leaving them on their own crap all the time. And you're 90, so you're, you get a layer at 18 weeks and you're getting that's right that's what we did here i'm not saying that's what we'll do forever we may brood some chicks we've got a good brooder empty that'll take you guys up and show you but uh man it's just a lot of feed going into those things and uh the, yeah the mortality and the brooder and all that so if you got somebody that's doing pullets that's reputable and you can trust them i'd look at it at least look at the economics of it uh even if you want to start, you could buy some of each. You could buy some chicks and some ready to lay. I think that's a good way to go too. Um, and right, you're gonna have to cycle time, them through. Then, exactly. Then you, yeah, you pull it every six months. And that's our plan right now. Yeah. Um, you one batch, go, one batch all the time. Well, we don't yet because we just launched this thing. I got you. And I'll talk more about this too. We actually did a joint venture with a local guy. Um, the story on this is actually kind of cool and it goes into the business part of this too is uh, I don't have the capacity to do an egg deal right now. I like eggs, I've got a market for eggs, but I don't have the capacity to run another venture on this farm. Um, we had a guy intern with us five years ago for about a year. He brought his family out, amazing guy, I really loved the guy. And then he went and started his own little homestead. He did a market garden, probably 150 egg layers. And then he did a uh, I mean, it was just a couple sheep and pigs, you know, the small five acre killer little thing. And he built a customer base. He did a great job, but he kind of hit that point where it was like, get out or grow, you know, five acres is really hard. It's not enough where you can do it full time at all, but it's also more than just, you know, going out there every once in a while. Like you got to be out there every day, the whole thing. So we kind of, we've always stayed in touch and I've supported him. Just, uh, I try to never burn bridges in this industry, try to stay friends with everybody. And we've always kept in touch with him. I like the guy. I said, dude, what if we just kind of combine forces and we structure a deal where I have the land and the labor and the coops, you can bring in the expertise and you're part of the labor. And uh, let's just figure out an ownership percentage split that works. And that way I have eggs and you have a place to kind of come. He doesn't have to be here every day anymore, but he put all the labor into the roost and the egg, the nest boxes and this, he put in half the capital to start the business. And so he has 50% now. So now I have, sure it's not a hundred percent, but I have 50% of a really cool egg business really without having to put too much work. in. I had to put in some money, but that's it. And uh, that's worked out pretty good so far. So Primal Pastures paid that business for the egg. That's exactly right. So we, got, we buy it for kind of a wholesale price, but it's a lot more than a normal wholesale price. We pay seven bucks to the egg business per dozen. And then we turn around yeah, it. Yeah, you don't half up. Exactly, exactly. Your retail knows for eight. eight. But the reality is with credit card fees and all that stuff, I'm getting about seven for Primal. So Primal is like breaking even on the back end, but I'm trying to make my 50% on the front end. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things with once you start retail or wholesaling eggs to another retailer, it becomes confusing. So for all intents and purposes, as far as the government's concerned, Primal Patch is producing them. But the reality is we have a separate entity producing and wholesaling the eggs for Primal to sell later. Um, what about washing and packaging? Under 3,000 in the state of California, we can do it all here. So I'll take you up and show you what we're doing for washing and packing. Do you guys have a license? We have egg handler's yeah. permit, 100 bucks, anybody can get it. Yeah, yeah. and that, that part of it's really easy. Yeah. Over 3,000 layers, you have to wash and pack at a state certified facility. And I have that ready to go, um, 12 so cents a dozen. FDA? Uh, maybe FDA actually. Yeah, is it FDA where you're at? 
Is that uh, so? Three thousand at state for me, under okay. three thousand, and then after three thousand, I have to. Then it becomes the FDA. FDA. Okay, that might be what it is here too. And uh, the FDA, uh, I talked to Christian a little bit at the after conference, and they get around. They, I mean, they don't get around it; they do it. Right. They comply with it. Right. The state guy is giving me a little bit of trouble, just saying like, "Well, there's a." Uh, there's no way you're going to test all the stuff that they need tested. Oh. It's really be kind of negative about it, but I don't know that That's what the state guys like, do. Yeah. Yeah. But some some people get around it by, they'll have one entity, one person has 3,000. Exactly. Another person has another 3,000. So. The take on all that stuff has actually been to just take the high road. It's not, yeah. a lot of times it's the harder way to do it, but for us, like, we'll just do everything USDA, do everything by the book. It just makes your life easier, especially now that I'm paying 15 different people. That's their sole income. I don't like messing with that stuff. So once we go over 3,000, we're taking them to the full egg packing plant. And yeah, they'll have to wash them. They'll have to do all the conventional stuff to them. But I'm not trying to skirt laws and do all that. It's too risky for me now, you know? Um, so yeah, even with the meat stuff, I try to get all the right permit, do all the right licenses, all that stuff. I didn't in the beginning at all. I think it would have been overbearing to try to do that in the beginning, but now that we got supporting a lot of families and stuff, I'm not trying to mess with it, you know? But yeah, we do have egg washing packing 30 miles from here that I've already got a deal worked out. Oh, nice. 12 cents a dozen, they'll do the whole thing. So it Which should be- packaging? Uh, no, I gotta pay for the carton still. Yeah. That's cheaper than my carton. Yeah, man. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, this belting material is some of the best innovation that we've had. It was really hard for us to keep these birds in. It is flat, but it's still undulating, and you come up with stuff all the time. Especially when you're coming fresh out of the brooder, those little baby chicks can squeeze under anything, man. So uh, this is, you can come up and feel it, but it's a pretty heavy duty rubber belting that we get out of uh, quarries. So we just call up quarries that are doing rock quarries and stuff, and these guys got this old belting. They shift out all the time. A lot of times it's nice, 14 inch, 18 inch wide, and we actually pick it up for free. These guys are just trying to get rid of it, so. Um, it's a really useful material. We've messed with a lot of different types of material like that, thinner stuff and stuff we paid a lot of money for. This quarry, uh, I guess conveyor belt from a quarry has been really nice stuff for us. And I think you could even go higher, you know? One cool thing about this, like when you're moving broilers, if you got a slow mover and they don't happen to get moved out, it'll just go right over them. And they don't like it, but uh, they'll definitely live through it, no problem, so. A chick won't get hurt either? Um, yeah, I know, not really. I got a lot more problems with bigger broilers not moving than chick. Chicks will pretty much move right along though. And with the broilers, we definitely run a second guy in the back when we're doing this, and he'll take the uh, hogs paddles and kind of scare the birds forward while they move. Um, but the layers, it's just not as important. How are you hooked? So you got chains on the corners, but you don't run one chain whole length. What are you coming and hooking onto? Chain comes to the tow hitch right about so there is here. A chain that comes all the way across. Yes. Yeah. We're moving this way. So. Oh, okay. You got chains on both sides. So you can go either direction. No, I'll just move the chain. Okay. Chain's expensive, man. Harvey, you got some chain there, right? Uh, that's just the chain to hook to. Yep. So it'll have like clips on it. Sure. And. You do. Yeah, you definitely do. The farther out you can go, the better, as far as angles go, right? Um, yeah, it's it's something I'm constantly kind of concerned about is the bending in. I, I guess I would say out of 70 coops, I don't have any that have like folded yet, but just thinking about it from an engineering perspective, yeah, you don't really want all that pressure you coming in. You could do something like that. We've tried that before. Angle kind of a pain. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Heavy yeah. I, I, I mean, really just a longer chain would be better. Um, and then we just use one chain. We'll just move the chain between the different coops. You don't need one on each one or anything like that. So you attach it each time. Exactly. Each one. You don't have one specifically for each coop. That's right. Okay. And there's no wheels on this. It's a drag. And That's drag. right. Yep. I see the upturn. <clears throat> what's the, you, you added the wood. Is that just to attach the chicken wire? It is, yeah. You can see it uh -huh. on the wire. a greenhouse that's basically modified to run birds in it. You never have any trouble with wind. Um, I'm not gonna say never. Yeah, we'll get 70 miles an hour probably at the at the other farm, and I've seen coops move, maybe a half coop or maybe a full coop, and that's a problem. No, it'll slide along the skids basically. Yeah. Uh huh. 
And that is a problem, actually. I mean, they, they come with ground anchors for that reason. 70s probably, 40s probably the max that you'd want to not ground anchor them. And uh, if you got little chick broilers or it's night and it's blowing like that, you'll kill a lot of birds with it sliding around. If you had one of these flip over on you? Not flip, no. Um, but again, we only get up to really like 70s probably our max wind and it'll slide a little bit yeah. if it's not anchored down. But not, not too bad. I mean, 70s rare for us. Sure. What do you do at the end of the field? Do you just hook on the other direction and pull it around or do you? Kind of messing with that. So our model right now has come to the end of the field and we'll just kind of tweak it out and over a couple, like a couple moves come back to here. Um, it's really not set to slide that way, but we've started doing that. I hope we don't break one, but... Square piping is really hard to pull right. that way. I think there's something that you can... Well, a pen dolly or something it. kind of thing that you can pop under there and slide it over real easy. Would I haven't they, figured it out yet. Would they customize a, a round tube for you on the bottom? Uh, I haven't asked them. I don't know. Seven suns is, it's round. Right, and that'll slide sideways. better, sideways. for sure. Um, if you've got a good tractor, it'll definitely pull it sideways, you know. But for us, we just hook the truck up and kind of like boom, 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 and get out of the track and then get back on and then start from there. So you lose a little bit of acreage, but like insignificant. Yeah, right. I just don't like tweaking these things. It doesn't feel super good, you know? Well, what is the length of your caster? This is 900. I think we're at 1,200 or so at the, at the other place. So it sounds like a lot, but it's not that many moves, you know? If you got 36 going into 1,200, whatever, that's only like 30 moves. Something like that. And we try, at the big farm production wise, we try to time it so that when it gets to the end of the field, it's empty. Cause then it's a lot easier to manipulate and move around. Full, really just back and forth. Empty is easy to put them wherever you want. We'll reset them, we'll set them wherever you want. You know, it's like Legos. Um, but fulls, you can't do that really at all. <clears throat> um, we do a quarter pound a day per bird. And that's for layers. I should mention too, this program that we run here is a certified organic feed, soy free, not cheap stuff. So when you hear $8 a dozen, factor that into the mindset. We got a lot of costs into these birds. I think we got probably four bucks a dozen into this um, at the end of the day. Did you buy them for $8 a bullet with orga like organic? Organic fed. So we gave them a two week period before we started selling any of the eggs. And the eggs are still good, but right. we just family and stuff for that period of time. Are you happy with the best nest, nest boxes? Are they keeping stuff clean? And... I have a rollout, like a, a, a crank nest box, but for what we have right here, it's low tech and it's fine. Yeah. And uh, they come with the pads that you can just switch in and out and we got a power washer to spray them down. Um, they do a pretty good job of rolling the eggs down and stuff. So yeah, I, I guess I'm happy. Let me to spare everybody from coming in, but at least you can kind of see the setup better. I'm gonna open this door and try to not let the birds out. If a couple get out, that's all right. But um, So the modifications that we have in here for the layers versus the broilers, this roost is obviously not, we don't use it for broilers. They would never use it. Um, the layers do definitely use it. We run a lot less feeders and waters for the layers than we need to for the broilers. A, there's half the birds almost in there. But B, they just don't eat and drink as much. Uh, nest boxes, obviously, is one of the big ones. We did install uh, a timed release for the for the fold down. So it's not set up on this one, but uh, basically, we come in and close these up at about two or three in the afternoon. And then there's a spring-loaded thing that'll, that'll drop them down. So that just saves us from having to send a guy out here at four in the morning or whatever. Uh, it's a lot easier to do it that way. Another problem with the uh, day range model is that you gotta have either a pop door that comes out or some way for the birds to actually get out. Again, this model kind of saves you that expense. So they're just, they're here anyways. You know, you don't have to deal with all that. And then, yeah, it's just the hen light is the only other thing. So the hen light is here and the control panel's here and the solar panel's there. So that's all we did to convert these into layer coops and so far I'm happy with them. Yeah, oh yeah, easily. I think it would do something twice this size probably. 
eventually I'm thinking that we'll probably take this whole side panel off in the summer just the to summer. get more breeze, man. Yeah. Uh, this is Velcro, so it comes up too, but it will get hot. I mean, this ranch gets really hot. We're sucked down in the valley, so yeah, I've, I've seen 118 on this ranch before, and that's, uh, birds don't like that. And you just gotta keep water on them. We do have a mister system, not installed here, but on all the broiler ones, we have to have that. Uh, I don't have it thermal regulated yet, so it's guys have to go through and turn them all on. That kind of sucks, but um, because we're in a really dry climate, misters work amazing. We can go from 110 down to 80 inside of the coop just from turning misters on. That will not work if you're somewhere that's humid. Adding water to humidity is the opposite of what you want to do. I don't really know what to do if you're 110 and 100% 100 humidity. The shields down in Florida take the summers off. It's too hot and too humid to do broilers for them. I'll tell you one thing we've done on the broiler coops too. We don't have it here, but we've done a drop down ceiling. So we get a billboard material and basically along the tops where the birds are roosting up way high, we'll run not the entire length cut off, but it almost makes an attic, you know, and we'll, co we'll cover about 80% of it just with a, a drop ceiling like that. And it traps a lot of heat up. And then in the cold, it traps a lot of heat down too. Um, and that's worked pretty well for us so far. It was an investment, but I think it was a good one. Just Eat setting a, dro a drop, yeah, summer and winter. Um, and it works pretty well. You gotta spray dander off of it and all that stuff and clean it between each batch. But yeah. no, I, I like the drop ceiling quite a bit. Yeah. Um, that billboard material is great. If you haven't used that stuff before, it's like the cheap for partition walls. All we use that stuff for all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And every once in a while you get like a real weird, funny billboard. Like <laughs> you got this Asian man, like, Staring down at our chickens because it was some Asian billboard is like the <laughs> most weird thing ever. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I, I expect these birds to come on and lay at really almost conventional rates, you know. Um, they got the benefits of confinement as far as the industry is concerned. They're not out, they're not exposed to wild birds, they're not out burning a ton of calories being all over the place. They get sunshine in the morning and the evening, but they get shade during the day. It's all kind of built in. So I, I really think that we'll be able to hit 80% lay rates uh, year round. I, I think we're gonna be able to do that. We'll see for sure, but um, so far, they're really coming online just right. So I'm happy with it. How have they adjusted to the rolling? Um, they weren't laying when we got them. So they had to start slowly figuring it out. So they didn't start on the ground very much? Not too much, no. I, we had a, we packed 40 dozen out of here yesterday. And uh, I think there was, two or three dozen dirties off the ground. Yeah, it's not too bad. I think 10% is kind of like a benchmark. If you're over 10 with dirty eggs, you're doing something wrong on management, 10%. And if you're under 10, probably got bigger fish to fry. Not gonna ever get 100%, I mean, exactly, right. I assume your motivation for your breeds was color variety exactly. and not, not running like complete egg layer hybrids to maximize production, but. It's like the primal pastures versus pasture bird. When I really scale eggs and I go commercial, I'll have Novagen pure. You know, all the same breed, all the same deal. But this is a tour farm. It's great for pictures. People really like to see all the different colored eggs and all that stuff. So for this, and it's what the, you know, the brooder had available for started pullets. It was just a bunch of different breeds. So this, I like that. But for hardcore commercial production, I'd keep the same breed running all the way through. And I would pick a Novagen. I like the Novagens the best for pastured egg production. <clears throat> Are the two by 12s on the side necessary for structure? Or instead of just the river uh, I don't, all the way around? Or is that part of the... If you're in a hilly area, they do help with structure. Help quite a bit because you look at that. I mean, it's going to flex like crazy. Some of that flex you kind of want though, as you're undulating, right? Yeah, a really rigid structure is going to leave you a lot of gaps. So I've never tried it without the two by 12 on there. Not sure. You need something to attach the chicken wire to. <clears throat> this is kind of our piece on broilers and layers. Since I don't have broilers here, so if you've got other broiler questions, that's my bread and butter. We'll talk more about some of the broiler stuff in the classroom, but yeah, any, any other questions on chickens, either egg layers or broilers right now? Okay, I wanna check the time real quick and see where we're at. We're at 10.09. We brood, I'll take you up to the brooder. And now I'm even, I'll explain, we got a whole nother brooder situation going, but um, 
I have done all of the above. I brewed it on pasture, brewed it in a stationary house, and now I've brewed in an actual chicken chicken house. So yeah, I'll, I'll explain the pros and cons of all those. Um, I wanna take you over to the, okay, sure. Are you still doing Freedom Yes, we run, uh, Primal Pasture sells a Freedom Ranger on certified organic soy free feed in this model. Uh, pasture Bird is mostly selling a Cornish Cross on conventional feed in this model. So two totally different economic structures, different markets, uh, different price points. But I like them both. I wish I could do everything Freedom Ranger organic, but the economics aren't there. So the Cornish on conventional has been our sweet spot for growth, for sure. Like in a big way. It's necessary to have a pasture bird, I mean a primal pasture, to complement pasture bird? Or do you think you well, just pasture bird? I think it's really nice when you get the customer, it's probably one out of 20 that says, tell me about your feed. Is it organic? Is it soy free? And I really like to be able to say, no, it's not, but we, our sister company it is. And here's your option to go buy that product. Uh, it saves me a lot of headache, right? Um, could you grow a conventional or even a GMO free Cornish cross line big? Yeah, I think so. Probably for me, it's kind of nice and primal started with that and it's never gone away from that. So I'd rather just keep it that way. Um, we were having a conversation yesterday. I don't mind soy. Organic soy is a great feed for chickens, uh, but there is a market out there that does not want soy and they think it's the devil. And so I'll cater to it. You know, if people are willing to pay the price, I'll cater to it, but it definitely slows down growth and it's a cheap, good protein. So when you take that out, you're gonna have to supplement with something else. Um, it's not easy. Like doing the, the soy free broilers is tough. Organic soy free is almost impossible. Organic soy free Freedom Ranger is suicide, you know? We're lucky that we've been able to do it, but uh, it's a very specific market that's willing to pay $32 for a whole bird. You know what I'm saying? That being said, I do 30, 40,000 of them a year. So we've grown the market, but uh, it's way smaller. No chef will ever buy that bird. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, we ran a trial of black Chinese silky chickens. I talked about a little bit of the APA conference and it was really just a marketing thing. Uh, when you're with chefs, they're, they're ADHD like crazy. So you wanna bring in new stuff every once in a while. And this is an easy way for us to run a special breed as a black meat chicken. Uh, and so we ran them, I'd say it was 14 weeks to slaughter and they probably averaged a pound and a half carcass weight. And uh, unbelievably slow growth, very tough, small birds. Uh, the chefs got really excited about it though, and we sold 600 in the first week just to chefs for like 18 bucks each on conventional feed. So the, the, the economics, I guess, worked. But I just took up a lot of coop space for what I probably could have ran three or four batches of Cornish cross through in the same amount of time. Really, it was. If it had taken off and everybody got really excited about it, I would do it more. But I've still got some. So yeah, uh huh. It's cool, I mean, it's different for sure. I got people that order them every once in a while, but uh, definitely not economically viable as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm now looking at other breeds too. Like I think doing that kind of thing, keeping it fresh for the chefs and showing them a different breed here or there or showing our customers something new every once in a while is cool, but the staple's always gonna be a Cornish cross on probably on conventional feed, you know? It is what it is. Do you ever, speaking of extremely inefficient ways of cruising chicken, do you ever run into the Immer Co. people and, sure. and some of their same customer base? You know, <laughs> <clears throat> we've cleaned up their mess significantly. They tried, they started out, this is a company in California a while ago, they started out with a heritage breed, 16 week. Amazing story, beautiful photos, and then you try it once and you never want to eat their chicken again. You know, it's tough as a boot, it's not good, it's can't cook, nobody liked it. The chefs thought they'd like it, they hated it. And so then they switched over to a Cornish, basically. They, really? they were on a day range, and, and they didn't up update the website, of course. Uh, Pretty website. <laughs> yeah, great website. Uh, they're also on a day range system, which again, for layers, I could justify a day range that you're moving every few days. For broilers, these guys, I mean, they weren't doing their own farming. They were contracting to another guy. Uh, they, they ended up with him after they burned a bridge with somebody in California. Um, but their model was essentially this. And look at this. I mean, after one day, you can see what it is. They, this farm was leaving it there for three, four months at a time. And so you can imagine the area where the broilers are spending 99% of their time is 
CAFO, right? I mean, it's full industrial level manure stacking up high. And sure, you get like 2% of the birds that maybe go outside, but the reality is they're living on their own crap every day. It's, it's a CAFO model. And uh, to me, it's just, uh, that's one of the hardest things about pasture poultry is we do things totally different. They're gonna call it pasture raised, I'm gonna call it pasture raised. So how do I differentiate myself without being the jerk that's talking crap about people? Uh, it's, it's the hardest thing about this business, you know? How do you explain that you're different without being the guy that's being negative all the time? It's really challenging, actually. And the chef doesn't have time to sit there and go, well, he said it was pasture raised. I gotta trust the guy. And you know, for us, all that comes back to the farm tours. That's why I think it's just one of the most important things that we do is, all right, chef, like come out, visit the farm, walk the field with me. I want to spend time and show you how regenerative ag works and daily move works and how benefits and stuff. So yeah, that's a whole different thing. Marketing labels and gimmicks and all that stuff is a whole other thing.